Shalom Mai Kako, and welcome to another broadcast of Roots Hawaii. My name is Walter Kawai'ai, your host. We are here at the wonderful studios of Think Tech Hawaii, located in downtown Honolulu, in the Pioneer Plaza building. Joining me today is my very special guest, Nijoni Chan. She is part Native American Indian and grew up on the Navajo Indian Reservation. Aloha, Nijoni. Aloha. Thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, and taking time off from your extremely busy schedule. Uh, before we talk story with Nijoni, I'd like to share a little bit about her uh, to our viewers that may not be familiar with her. As one world leader once said, and I quote, no success can compensate for failure in the home, end quote. Nijoni says, my family, my faith are the most important things in my life. And because of that, my pursuits for degrees and recognitions are secondary. My family, my children, my priority. After attending BYU Provo for one year, I met my husband and our family began. It's been a balancing act between school and motherhood. Joni shared with me one of her favorite Bible quotes, quote, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heavens, end quote. Joni is grateful to have had many opportunities to serve in her community and the church to which she belongs, even the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Aloha, mahalo once again, Nijoni. Aloha. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, where you're from. I, I, I think that's quite intriguing uh, that you, you know, in this, this century that we live in, that you grew up in a, a Navajo reservation. And tell our viewers what, what that experience was like for you. Sure. Um, I, a little bit about the reservation. It's on the, it's in the Four Corners area of uh, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, and Utah. And I lived in Utah for just a, a bit of time in the Monument Valley. We were raised there for about oh, yeah. 10 years. And, um, and it was wonderful waking up every morning and seeing the sunrise and I seeing bet. the sunsets behind the Red Rock. Um, and then we moved into Kianta just uh, over the border. Um, my dad's a school teacher, so he took a job there. And, and that's where I, my parents still reside. And I'm, I claim I'm from Kianta. And people ask oh, me where you. I'm from. And Kianta is in Arizona. Kianta is in Arizona. So, yes. I mean, you know, okay, forgive me if, if this sounds crazy when I ask this question, but so if I were just driving, you know, just driving throughout Arizona, would there be something that would tell me that I'm now entering the Navajo Reservation? No. no. It would just no. blend in like any other it city? It would just blend in. You would see probably a lot of Native people. Okay. And, you know. That would be a clue. Huh? That would be a clue, some Native words on buildings and things like that. But other than that, I don't think you'd be able to tell really that you were that you were on the reservation. And I guess that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. wonderful. <laughs> um, tell me a little bit about the, the, the historical background of the Navajo Indians. I mean, I know there are a lot of uh, Native American Indian tribes yes. in the United States. And, and by comparison, in terms of the, the Navajo Nation, uh, how is it ranked? Uh, is it one of the largest, right. the largest? Right. I thought I read somewhere that it was like the second or third it's largest. The second largest, yes. Second largest. Cherokee, I think, comes up before the Navajo Nation um, for federally, federally um, recognized, you know, people who've claimed that tribe. Um, the Navajo Nation, though, as a whole, the land mm -hmm. is the biggest, the biggest in the U.S. What is the so largest? it's the largest as wow. far as the reservation. Um, size. You know, tell me something because I, I, you know, in preparing for this show, I, yeah. I googled some, you know, I tried mm -hmm. to educate myself. And I saw an area that had like four mountain peaks, mm -hmm. and within those mountain peaks was the, the, reservation. the reservation. Can you share with us? I mean, that's quite sure. unique. Yeah, um, our people from the very beginning, I mean, our, uh, our orally, our history has you know, been passed down orally, and it's been told that our people believe that if we were lived between the four sacred mountains, there's a mountain to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west, that if we were within that, that we would be safe, we would be protected, it's sacred. And so there was a point in history where the government came and tried to take, you know, remove, remove our peoples from, uh, from, these, from this area, and they did. They were removed for a time, but when it came time to um, work with the government and with treaties and other, you know, other things, we were able to, to reclaim that area within the four um, sacred mountains. And our people still live there to this day. The reservation sits inside it's those four sacred mountains. And, and that's um, where you grew up. And that's where I grew up, wow. yes. So, you know, looking now, you know, fast forward to, you know, this time in your life, 
When you look back on that experience, um, Tell us the, the positive things as you refer, because maybe growing up as a yes. kid, as a child, you may not have seen that right. as being, yay, right. best place to grow up. But when you reflect now as an adult and in the times that we live, uh, what are some of the positive takeaways, you know, as an adult? As an adult. Um, I am able to teach um, recently. We, I wish I had a picture of my son, but he is serving a church mission in the Marshall Islands. And there the people have nothing. They, um, they, you know, wait for the rainwater. They collect the rainwater, and he washes his clothes in the bucket. And <laughs> he, you know, he's gone on and on, told us he climbs coconut trees for his breakfast in the morning and fishes for his dinner. And um, I, as I shared um, with him before his mission and my mother, we shared, he knows, he knows that that's the way my mother grew up, and that's where I'm from. There are people still, you know, right. on the, in the United States that live that way and on the reservation without electricity, without running water. Yeah. Um, and so I think for him, it, it was there was a appreciation for their culture, knowing that, um, you know, we, mm -hmm. he's our Navajo side is very alike in that way. There was an appreciation and an understanding. And um, I think I, I think it built in me an empathy for others. And, and it doesn't matter where I go. I know that, you know, if in those circumstances that I, I've, I've lived there and I've, my grandparents and we've been, you know, we've been seen those, those things. Yeah, and so I, I can see appreciate how that, that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a blessing, as you mentioned blessing. early yeah. earlier. Um, I know we have a, we'd like to uh, show a picture of your mom. I, I believe oh. this is your mom. Yeah. What a beautiful lady. Mm -hmm. I, mom's still alive? <laughs> Mother's still alive, yes. Um, she is full Navajo, um, group born and raised on the Navajo reservation. And um, I could say so much about my mother that she's been through so much, um, just trials and hard things. Mm -hmm. And I'm just grateful that she um, taught us and made it, you know, it was very important for us to, to go, go to school, to know about our family, to um, know our culture. And to, um, and as members of the you know Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, she is very a uh, very strong and faithful member of that church, and has taught us and instilled in us a lot of those values and standards as well. And so your mom, I mean, just looking at that picture that we got to see, um, you know, the, uh, do you see some yeah. similarities uh, in the Navajo Indian culture? That, you know, because you live here in Hawaii right. now, you, you're obviously exposed to the native Hawaiian culture uh, and being where you, you actually live, and we can get there, get, talk about that later. Um, what are some of the similarities you see? You know, being raised by your mom, and now you have your own children, and, you know, you're trying to provide, I would assume, to your children the best of both cultural indigenous people's worlds, if there's such a phrase, being the Navajo as well as the Hawaiian. Um, how is that being blended in your family now as you're raising your children? Sure. My, um, I talked to my mother this morning, and she reminded me that, um, you know, in my, it, with my genealogy, I have my Navajo side and my, my dad's side, which is white. We call it a Navajo Bilagana. And um, she said, your children, they're going to have, and she said, you know, listed on my husband's side, the Hawaiian, the Chinese, the Filipino, and then, you know, your Navajo and your, your Bilagana side. And she reminded me that I need to, you know, I need to do my part in teaching them, you know, that, about where they, you know, about the Navajo culture and about where they came from. And, and as much as I, you know, I can, I can share. And so family is very important. In our, and that's the first thing that you know, my mother taught me was my clans and where I'm from, and my grandparents and their clans, because they help us to know in our, you know, in our genealogy um, where our families are from. And it helps us to tie into you know, who we're related to or who we don't marry because they're cousins or <laughs> they're closely related. Right, so we, right. we know we have a clan system. Yeah. And yeah. You know, that, that's similar to the Hawaiians, but I'd like to have uh, our engineer uh, bring up our next picture. And I think this is a picture of... Um, your dad. Yeah. So tell us a little bit, you know, we're going to diverse a little, get away from the Navajo side. But your dad has an interesting story and his connection to his the Navajo, connection. doesn't he? Can yes. you share that with us? Yes. Um, he is uh, in this picture uh, uh, at West Point. 
Uh, he lived in Pennsylvania and played football and did really well. He was really did well with football that uh, West Point wanted him to come out and play football for them. So he went and was um, there for a while, for a time playing football, and realized he just didn't enjoy it, didn't want, he wanted something different. And um, in his, you know, just trying to figure out what he wanted to do, he found, it came upon a magazine of some sort and mm -hmm. saw about a story about uh, Brigham Young University and their football program. And he was very intrigued and wanted to, you know, wanted to know more about it. He had a car and he packed it up and he drove out to Utah and he made himself part of that football team. He was able to wow. play football for so the he was a good athlete. He was a good athlete, wow. yes. Very yes. good. Now, your dad wasn't a member of the church. He wasn't a member of the okay. church. Yes. But he headed off to he the He headed Midwest. off to the Midwest to, you know, in hopes of being able to you know, play football. And, and he felt like that was where he needed to go and play. But I assume dad played football, uh, graduated from uh, Brigham Young University. Yes, he did. Yeah. Um, so how does, how does he meet your mom? I mean, yeah, so um, in his, you know, being able to be on the, the university campus, he, I, I shared the story with you, but he one day it was a Sunday, and he was out running, <laughs> and everybody else was dressed in white shirt and ties and dresses, and they were all headed to a building. Um, and he asked, he asked, where's everybody going? I can't, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm wondering. <laughs> and they said, there, well, there's a prophet, a prophet that is visiting today. And so he decided to go and follow. He had brought, been brought up with the Bible and knew there was prophets and wanted to know. And Curious. yeah, and then he went to this gathering where he saw and um, knew that the prophet at that time was President Spencer W. Kimball. And he, from so there. That yeah, would have been in the 70s, right? That would have been in the 70s, yes. Okay. Um, from there, he took missionary discussions and learned more about the church and wanted to serve as a mission. So he was called to serve on the Southwest Indian Mission, which is the Navajo Reservation. And is that where he met your mom? He didn't meet my mom on his mission. He, oh. he ended up uh, serving his two years, and he actually met my mom's the family. He served in the area where my mom's family, but never met my mother. And they, when he went back to Brigham Young University, um, later met my mother. And she was attending? She was attending Brigham oh. Young University. Okay. Met, yeah. So in, in the universe, that, that is not happenstance uh, <laughs> when you think about it. You know, the right. odds, your dad's a, he's a cadet at West Point. Right. He, for whatever reason, decides he doesn't want that and flips open a magazine, of all things, and then finds Brigham, Brigham Young, Young University. University. Probably didn't know anything about Brigham Young University other than, as you said, a great football program. And, you know, he was a good athlete. Right. Got into the university and played football. Um, still hadn't met your mom yet, served, joined the church, served the mission, and All ironically right. in the Navajo Nation, right. met your mom's family, still didn't meet your mom, <laughs> goes back to school after serving a successful mission, and then they're on campus. So right. you kind of get the notion that, you know, um, somebody <laughs> up there had their hands right. in, in the preparation of this. You know, right. when you fast forward, and look at where your life is, your children, and everything that's happened to all of you. Um, maybe we can have uh, Rob put up our next picture here, your family picture. So I, I'm not even gonna, I love black and white photos. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, I just, you know, wow, this is old. So maybe you can describe to us. Uh, yes, so that's my grandmother that's there at the bottom. And I included her because um, that's my mother's mother. She never got to go to school. Um, she was, uh, during that, you know, those years, her um, brothers and sisters were rounded up by soldiers, and she should have been too, to attend boarding school. And my, her parents, who are in the picture, her father standing there and her mother's next to her, um, decided to hold her back and hide her in a water barrel so that she couldn't um, leave, that she would be there to work hard and help them with the sheep and whatever it was. And so she, she stayed behind. And um, we're really grateful for, for her, my grandmother because she's instilled in us the importance of you know, education. She never got that. And she really wanted that for her posterity. And so she shared it when she could, her story, and that she wanted us to, to have you That know, was a good motivating that. factor to pass on to right. her children and her posterity. Right. Well, folks, we are talking story with our special guests uh, this afternoon. 
here at uh, Roots Hawaii, Najoni Chun. But we're going to take a 60 second break. And you're watching Roots Hawaii. I'm your host, Walter Kavaiaya. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, achieving and sustaining success, and finding greatness. If you're a student, parent, sports or business person, and want to improve your life and the lives of people around you, tune in and join me on Mondays at 11 a.m. as we go beyond the lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha, y'all. My name is Mitch Ewan. I'm from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, and I'm the host of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We're on every Wednesday at 4 o'clock, and we hope that we have interesting uh, guests who talk to us about various energy things that are happening in Hawaii, all the way from PV to windmills to hydrogen, close to my heart, electric buses and electric vehicles. So please dial in every Wednesday at 4 o'clock on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. Aloha mai kako, and welcome to Roots Hawaii. I'm your host, Walter Kawaiia, and we're here talking story with our special guest, Nijoni Chan. So, you know, we, we were talking about you know, that picture that was shown of your grandmother. My grandmother. And uh, so she was one of 14 children? One of 13. 13. Yeah. And you were, you were sharing with us how your, your, your mother, I mean, her parents, mm -hmm. uh, your great grandparents, decided to hold her back and allow right. the other children that were being taken really for school right. to be schooled. She stayed home. So she lost out on that opportunity right. uh, to Literate receive and to a read formal and education. Write. Mm -hmm. But I mean, thinking back, I mean, obviously your family became the beneficiaries of her trial of not being educated and literate. Because as you were saying before the break, she really, as she grew older, she really promoted that, if I could use that word, amongst her family. Uh, to how important it was for them to get an education and to become literate in, in that way. Um, tell us more about that. So, I mean, you're a generation removed from that, but did yeah. you know her? I did. We would go regularly to visit her. My mother was always very good at taking care of her mother and would go, and um, especially after my, my grandfather passed away, but even before that, and there were responsibilities to do. She still did corn. We had acres and acres of blue corn. And sheep, she had hundreds of sheep. And so when we would go visit grandma, if she wasn't home, we knew she was probably at the cornfield or she was at the, you know, doing the sheep. And so my mother would know, okay, let's go find grandma. So we would go out and we'd go drive. And when we get there, grandma had responsibilities for us when we got there. It was get out, you know, go water the, the corn or, you know, we were, you know, she gave us something to do to, to help in those, those tasks. And, and were you, as a young, how old were you? Um, Back then? Uh, I probably, uh, when I can remember, probably about five, okay. five or six that I can remember. Okay, maybe a five-year-old yeah. might be thrilled about going out there and helping grandma if she's right. shearing the sheep. Right. Uh, but, I, you know, if you're a teenager, <laughs> maybe not. I don't know. So <laughs> you, you value know. those experiences. I do. What lessons, uh, I'm sure you've shared those experiences with your own children yes. uh, in raising them. And so what, was, what would have been your takeaway from, from that, even though you were five years old? Um, how have you translated that into a learning opportunity right. to share with your children? Yes, um, I, we, we have always had a garden. Um, my mother and dad, you know, father have always gardened, but I do that myself. I, I live up on Kamehameha School's campus right now, and I had to ask, you know, please give me an area <laughs> to grow, grow a garden. And, did and, they? and, and they didn't, but we, we went ahead and we figured a way to, to, to work with it, and we've, we've still got a garden. Excellent. And my kids help, and there there's a piece of property that you know that we we live on, and they have people that do it for us who come and mow and want to do it for us. I said they were going to take care of it, but I've said no. My kids are going to to do that, and so I make them mow, and it takes them a, a, a good part of the day to to get that whole yard done. Not only mow, but you know there's other responsibilities sure. as well. But I was brought up that way. My mother was brought up that way, and that's values that you know my right. grandmother. 
I grew up seeing, and, that's, that's and I appreciate. That's the good part of what Grandma had to go through. Right. Yeah. Right. And her posterity reaps the benefits of that. Right. Uh, you know, because we live in a very different world. Our kids, so many kids, don't necessarily have that opportunity right. uh, or chores. Um, so, uh, I, I've been wanting to ask this question. What actually brought your family here to Hawaii? Yes. Yeah, so, um, my husband's job. He okay. was two years ago. We were um, living comfortably in a, in Utah, and we were near all of our my family and his family. Actually, migrated and have since from Wahiwa moved to um, to Utah, and so we had we're surrounded by family and friends. And um, my husband um, was actually asked to uh, apply for a, a position here in on the islands, um, Kamehameha Schools, and he did. And it was a prayerful, prayerful effort to whether we would, you know, accept and do it or not. And I wouldn't have been able to do it had I had that, you yeah. know, assurance and that this is where we're supposed to be. I mean, we need to move. That, that's a huge move for your whole family. Yes. Um, and maybe, you know, my, your, you and your husband could make that kind of move, but then you have your children. I mean, you, you're literally yes. uprooting your children yes. from the place they were born, the friends they have, close right. to family. Uh, how how did, has that all worked out? Yeah. Were, were your children, yay, let's go to Hawaii? <laughs> I think for a while it was kind of the honeymoon period, you know, oh, or okay. beach and all yeah. kinds of fun things, sure, sure. you know. And then it was, oh, when are, who are we going to spend Thanksgiving with? And, oh. you know, a lot of the, you know, understanding that. But in that, we have learned that there is family here. Yes. And there is, there, there is distant sure. family that we're learning of and we're gathering with now that we would have never had that experience had we remained, you know, where we were at. Right, and right. so we have learned a lot about, um, you know, family, family right. here on the island, and that we do have it. We just have, we've, we've had to do the work to find them. <laughs> and, yeah. That's, that's the positive. Yeah, right, for the that's kids. the positive. That's what, and for the whole family. Yes. Okay, I'm sure our viewers out there mm -hmm. uh, who may not still be familiar with uh, Nijoni Chun and her husband, so we won't, we won't keep it a secret. This show is not about him. It is about Nijoni no, and her growing up uh, in the Navajo Reservation. But uh, Nijoni's husband is uh, Dr. Taran Chun, who is the headmaster up at the Kamehameha Kapalama campus. Uh, and I'm sure all of the students up at uh, Kapalama campus knows who Nijoni is and, of course, love the, uh, loves their family uh, as much. All right. You mentioned a connection you felt you know, with your tribe um, and to the Hawaiian Islands. Right. And the experience it's been, you know, the honeymoon period is over, but now you're growing, the family's growing through that. What similarities have you and your family, uh, you see in the, in the two cultures? You know, it's like you have uh, two worlds that your children are part of, the Navajo, yes. because they have Navajo blood in them, as well as Hawaiian, Chinese, and, and all the other ethnicities. So they're in the they're really in the right setting in terms of the ethnic background that they have within them because Hawaii is known for the you know the right. camaraderie and the complex of all of the ethnic races that grew up here so um, do you see similarities yes I do um, something that I just share to to um, remind remind us that in the beginning we were all one people my mother did recently did a DNA test you know, to see she's full Navajo, right? <laughs> well, her DNA test came back 86% Native American, 13% Asian, and then the rest was Polynesian. Really? And she said, I didn't know I was Polynesian. But we know, and we have records, you know, we, in our church, we have a record called the Book of Mormon that shares that we were all one people at one time. And there was a man named Hagoth that came across the ocean, you know, and brought a group sure. of people. And so with that, I, I know that there are, are you know, there are similarities that we, that we enjoy as, sure. as peoples. One of them being a strong connection to our families. We, our family, there's a, um, in the Hawaiian culture, we talk about Hanai. Right. Um, you know, and, and Native Americans or Navajo is the same way. Grandparents raise children. Family help each other. We take care of each other. We, we you know, it's a family. It's important. Um, yeah, I think our, the way that we identify, um, mm -hmm. we connect is, um, you know, the Very way we similar. introduce our, ourselves, and, and, and there's a way that we do that in Navajo. We, we talk about, I shared with our clans, there's a way to, you know, to find ourselves orally. We don't have that written, 
there's oral traditions and history that's been passed along. Okay, I'm glad you brought that oral. So we know across, <clears throat> and you and I were talking about this as we were driving down. So Hawaiians had an oral, tra oral tradition, meaning they had no written language. Right. And not until the arrival of Westerners, or whether they be missionaries or European travelers, that began the process for them of identifying the language and, write, right. and then writing a language. Right. Um, I understand the Navajo has the same tradition. They were oral tradition. They were oral. You want to share a little bit with our viewers and kind of how, when did that change? We, I assume we have a written language now. And yes. Talk about the, the Navajo language and how all of that tradition got written. Yes. So the Navajo people, uh, up until the 1800s, um, didn't have a, you know, we didn't have a, a record. And so um, after about the 1800s, when they began reservations and government removing people from areas, and they began taking censuses of families. And, you know, that began, okay, the head and then the children. And um, because of, you know, those records we have, you know, back to the 1800s. But after that, there were um, other, I mean, it took a while before, you know, there was boarding schools that strict, mm. it didn't allow the children to know their language, kind of tried to pull, you know, squeeze that out of, you know, families and out of, you know, out of our people. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't written until even later, and I think in the early 1900s. Um, okay. And thus, I, I shared with you the story of the Navajo Code Talkers. Yes. And, you know, and how that plays a part, and how I feel some connection to Hawaii because of that, that piece of history that we have. So Nishoni just mentioned uh, the word talker, uh, the, the Navajo talkers. There was a movie that came out about that, and, and we're, we're running out of time, uh, so we'll have to come back on another show. Uh, and um, tell us a little bit, because your mother, you were sharing with me, your mother's maiden name right. was Talker. Talker. So share a little bit about that. Yeah, she, um, we don't know where, it began with our great-grandfather, but we don't know where that, why that name, except that maybe he, like we were talked about, maybe he was a historian, maybe he, he just talked a lot. But <laughs> he was given that as an English name, that wasn't I his see. Navajo name. No. And, and, but um, the Navajo, you know, the Navajo Code Talkers was just a, a slightly different, you know, it wasn't any way related to that, but. I think yeah. what you shared with me earlier was that because the Navajo language mm -hmm. was so complex in terms of its, you know, the language itself, that I guess the, the U.S. government saw that as an opportunity use um, to use it mm -hmm. at, in code form during the Second World War. Right. And that's how the, this whole thing, the, the Navajo Talker, right. Right. That's really interesting. Well, we're running out of time, folks. And um, so one last question before, and I could, I'd like to ask uh, Rob to throw up that. It's really the last picture that we have, the whole family. Um, yeah, there we go. So that, that's a beautiful picture. That's your family. I see your family and your children in there, and I guess your extended family. Beautiful. Yeah. And is that, would that be somewhere in the Navajo Reservation area? No, this is actually in Utah where everybody was living at one time, okay. and now we're all over the place. All but over the place, yeah. That was a good time to take a picture because we were all there. <laughs> uh, briefly, tell us, what kinds of records um, would people be able to use today to find yes. if they wanted to search out their um, novel ancestry? Yes. Um, I shared with you the census records that started in 1885 for the Navajos. Um, there is an index on Ancestry.com, as well as Family Search is getting those ready to, to put out. Um, and those are probably very key. Um, the Navajo government, as well, has records, um, family group cards, and records that they began keep keeping about the same time in chapter houses. And, and those are accessible only going to the reservation. Um, there are also, um, I shared with you as well, about Doris Duke. There was an heiress of a tobacco company. She right. had lots of money that she, was, she used to cre uh, collect oral histories. And so there are a couple places on this, well, a few universities on, in the Southwest. University of Utah, there's one in um, UNLV. They um, house um, those, those oral records, those oral wow. histories that were collected. Well, wow, invaluable. Mm -hmm. Well, we are definitely out of time, folks. And I want <laughs> to take this opportunity to acknowledge our special guest, Nijoni Chun. And for all that she's been able to share with us today, some wonderful stories about her life on the reservation and her family, her extended family and her roots, and about, about that beautiful family.
Thank you for joining us here at Roots Hawaii. I'm your host, Walter Kavaiaya, and until we meet again on our next episode, take care, everyone. Aloha no.